So if you've got your Bibles, turn to uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 1 onwards. A very well-known scripture, but probably what we're going to look here, I think, is we're going to be looking at the true meaning of this scripture as a whole. So we've learned a lesson here, even though I've got a point of what I'm going to be talking about. What I want to talk about is a very, very, very big thing. Luke chapter 16. 17, sorry, 17. A very, very, very big thing that is a big thing among the others is unforgiveness. Talk about what the Bible says about unforgiveness. Right? And we all know what unforgiveness is, don't we? Because it's something that just comes along with travelling people. Yes. Like Johnny was saying the other day, I know even in my my old life, there was people we wouldn't even talk to, and I didn't even know them. And we didn't talk to them. And we weren't allowed to talk to them. Because same happened with grandfathers and grannies years ago. Do you know what I mean? All that. Do you know what I mean? So let's have a look at this. When you read this scripture, it's not usually what we would use this scripture for, but you've got to understand when we get into it, right? Chapter 17, verse 1. Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offences should come, but woe to him for whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were to be hanging around his neck and he would be thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourself, brothers. If you sin against your brother, if, uh, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Yeah, it's all about forgiveness. <coughs> And if he, gets, if, he, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. And which of you having a servant... Ploughing or tending sheep will say to him, when he, is coming, when he is coming from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. But will you not rather say to him, Pre- prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drank, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank you that the servant, because, uh, do you thank the servant because he did these things that were commanded him? I think not. So, likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants, we have done what is our duty to do. Amen. So let's pray. Before we get into it, thank you, Lord. Pray for me. Pray the Lord speaks for me, Lord. And as you ask him, my Lord, let me pray. Let me feel you, my God, for your glory, for your praise. Speak for me, Lord. 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 So really from um, about verse um, 3, it's talking about forgiveness, right? And he says, take it yourselves, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, if he repents, forgive him. Um, Christ is teaching his disciples here about forgiveness, yeah? Um, they know it's going to be hard, because what he says to them, they say, listen, look, um, there's a, another story I'm reminded of when Peter comes to, the, to Jesus. He says, how many times shall I forgive my brother? And he says, uh, seven times, Lord. <laughs> well, the, 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 the Jews, the, the Pharisees said that you should forgive someone three times. And after you forgive them three times, then that's it. They're, forget about it. Drum them. They're lost calls. Let them get on. Do you know what I mean? And so Peter thinks probably he's saying a good thing and goes, like, should I forgive them seven times? Like... Double plus one. And Jesus is saying here, look, if your brother returns to you seven times, then you should forgive him seven times. Somewhere else in the scripture when he said that that to Peter, he said, look, seven times 70. And what he's saying is that an unnumerable amount of times, uncountable amount of times, seven times seven times 70 times 7,000 times 700 times 7 million uh, every time. 
every time, at every moment, at every point, every time, for whatever reason, if your brother returns to you and repents, that we should forgive him. So they, in hearing this, they're saying, look, if your brother comes to you and he, and he comes to you seven times in one day and says, look, I'm, I'm sorry, he repents, forgive me, I'm sorry, then you should forgive him seven times. And straight away they're like, Lord, increase our faith. And what they're asking their faith to be increased with is that, Lord, this is like, so I've got to forgive him seven times. And then if he comes back again tomorrow, another, sure, I'm better off just kicking him in the backside and I'm saying, get off down the road. Do you know what I mean? Christ, the Lord is talking to me about forgiveness. And what he's saying to them is, they said, look, increase our faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith of a mustard seed, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you could tell this mulberry tree be pulled up and be planted in the oak like in the sea. Now we've never heard that, right? We use that verse, didn't we? If you've got faith of a mustard seed, oh, so and so, so this is going on. So, if you've got faith of a mustard seed, oh, I'm not too sure. If you've got faith of a mustard seed, and we use it with every other thing in our spiritual life at all. And we believe it. I'm not saying you can't. But in context of Scripture, in this story, what Jesus is talking about is if you've got the faith of a mustard seed, he said to the disciples, then you can forgive. Because this is the one, and it Johnny mentioned it before. Well, I'm a Christian now, I forgive them, but I shan't forget. But you don't forget, it's not forgiveness. Because the, when, when we got saved, when I got saved, God took everything I ever did, and not only forgive me, but he forgot about it. He didn't hold it against me. He don't bring it back up. He ain't like us. Do you know what I mean? Someone will say, oh, so and so and so. Go, remember what you done 50 years ago? Do you know what I mean? And think, God, like, remember what your grandfather done to my grandfather? He wasn't even born. He wasn't even there. Do you know what I mean? And we know every detail, which way he turned, what he done, what he said. Do you know what I mean? But in God, God is teaching us. He's saying to him, listen, they're saying, oh, Lord, we've got to forgive someone. This is too much. Increase our faith. We ain't got the faith for this. And Jesus said, all right. If you've got faith for the ministry, what really what Jesus is saying is you have got the faith to do this. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'll, I'll explain to you, right? The leaders of the Jews, in verse 6, it says, so I'll read it. So he said to them, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say that this mulberry tree be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Say to a mulberry tree, be rooted up by them and be planted in the sea. If you had the faith of a mustard seed. Now, the, the rulers of the Jews, Jesus was very pacific when he used the mustard seed because uh, the leaders of the Jews, they was always arguing about uh, how much of a thing was, of a, was actually counted to be something because of the Sabbath day laws. Because it was like this. The Jews believed, right, on a Sabbath day, yeah, that you wasn't allowed to plough, you weren't allowed to work, so you weren't allowed to plough. So they believed if you spit on the ground... And it rolled and made like a little dent in the dirt. You're ploughing. Right? So this is why they're saying, well, what can you do? This is the argument. What, if, you, if you wore a shoe, if a man wore a shoe, sometimes they had a shoe, the Pharisees wore a shoe, had a little eel on it. On the Sabbath day, they'd wear flat shoes. Because if it had this little eel on it, it's working the calf muscle, overworking the calf muscle a bit more than it normally would. That's working. If they walk through the field... They went somewhere, a short distance, walked to get water. So you could only walk a certain amount of distance on a Sabbath day. They walked a short distance and tripped and kicked up dirt that ploughed. If they walked through a field and got grain stuck to them, or something plant, they've harvested. There was all this, God give them these laws and they might put it under a microscope again and again and again and again and again. So what they'd say is, how much of a thing is a thing? If I walk through a field, what's the smallest thing I can have on my shoe and I haven't harvested or ploughed or gone against, not really God, but the Pharisees, really? Because that was their law that they impounded on God's law. So they said a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Have you ever seen them, them book marks? They've got a little mustard seed on them. Boys, they're like a, like a fit for an eye of a needle. It's a speck. It's a speck, a mustard seed. And what they said is, if you had a mustard, any, a, a, 
something the amount of a mustard seed on you, then it don't count. Anything bigger than a mustard seed, it counts. But a mustard seed and under, it's a mustard seed is the smallest amount of something that's measurable to the Jews. Do you understand what I'm saying at this time? They would measure things and they'd say the smallest amount measurable possible is a mustard seed. So what Jesus is saying, when they said increase our faith, he said, you've got faith of a mustard seed. He's saying, if you've got the smallest amount of faith possible that you could possible for you to have that's considered to be faith, you could tell a mulberry tree to be ripped up and planted in the ocean. The smallest thing possible. How small can a fa- my faith have? How powerful is faith? That if it's the smallest amount possible, it can move a mountain. It can tell a tree to be pulled up. It can do great things. So, and listen, I can't do none of them things, can you? But yeah, that faith is enough to forgive. Because what we say is, I can't do it. It's impossible. Listen, I forget about them people I forgot about what they've done, but I won't never be able to forgive them. For Jesus said, I don't need to increase your faith. You already have what's needed to forgive. A mustard seed's worth can do something so great. If you've got something even as small as that, you, you're able to forgive. And boys, let me tell you something, that's a great comfort to me and an encourage to me. That Jesus saying on about, I always thought that Christianity was about big faith. If you want to be like Moses, you've got to have big faith. If you want to be like David Jones and Jackie Boyd and Albert, you've got to have big faith. If you want to be like Talis and the French brother going to these other countries and Nino and that, it's dangerous, you've got to have big faith. It's always about, yeah, hang about, Jesus is saying, hang about big faith. Doing great things is not about having big faith. Because the smallest of faith, you can command a mulberry tree to be picked up and planted somewhere else. Mm-hmm. What the problem is, small faith ain't the problem, it's no faith is the problem. Mm-hmm. It's no faith. That's where the problem comes. What an encouragement it was to me to know that I don't have to have big faith to see great things happen in my life. How many times I've beat myself up, and you might be the same as me, where something hasn't happened in your life that you've prayed for, or something that you've decided hasn't come to be, or never happened in your life, and you thought it was because you was no good and you never had enough faith. Because you keep hearing people say, if you've got faith, faith of a mustard, you think, well, well it's the truth, nothing good's happening. I, I, I've been praying for loads of things, and I can't have no faith at all. And we start beating ourselves up. Because we think, well, it ain't about big faith. It's the smallest of faith Jesus is saying can do great things here. It's about no faith. It was, I got encouraged when I thought, Lord, I, I thank you because, because I, I know now that I desire great things to happen in my life and in my family's life and in our own life. I desire healings and things like that. And even if I've got small faith, then things can still happen. Because there are movements and there is missions and there is churches where they say, uh, uh, oh, I prayed for that and that never happened. Well, you ain't got no faith then. You ain't got no faith. And that's not true. It's just not true. I do what the Bible says. We know we will receive all things that we have asked for when we pray according to his will. Amen. When we pray according to the Lord's will, we know we're going to get it. Not, oh, if you ask it in Jesus' name, you're going to get it. Name it and claim it. The Bible does say everything you ask for in Jesus' name, you will receive. But when you ask according to his will. Amen. That's the point. That's why them things don't happen. Because God didn't want them to. And we have to have, and we have even have the faith to accept that. So here we're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about forgiveness. So turn to Matthew 13. So Jesus is saying, they've come to him and said, look, he's talking about forgiveness. All of a sudden they've buckled. Oh Lord, increase our faith. He's saying, listen, you've got faith of a mustard seed. You can do this great thing. So you have enough faith to to forgive. Matthew 13, 57. It says, so they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, right on, well, the right one, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, they was offended at him. So Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honour except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. As we see, it was no faith that was the problem. Jesus never done many mighty works in that place because there was no faith. In fact, I think it's probably possible that in the New Testament, you don't see anyone get ill or anything like that unless at some point there's faith involved. Do you know what I mean? Your faith has made you well. Your faith, you've been, your faith has healed you. You've been made more well by your faith. Even that woman, she'd believe she could just press through and touch him of his garment. Just the edge of it would be enough that she could be healed. And it was her faith that made her well. It's not about big faith. I mean, we have to understand saying it was Christians. I always used to beat myself up. Why aren't this happening? I must not believe. I ain't got big faith. I can't go and do that because I ain't got the faith they've got. Jesus is teaching the disciples the smallest amount of faith can do great things. Amen. Because what is faith? Faith is not, oh, I can do. Yeah. Faith is, he can do. Jesus. And when you've got your trust in him, like Johnny was saying, the shield, you've got your trust in him, all things are possible. The Bible says, when man things are impossible, we've got all things are possible. And it's possible for us to forgive, to let go of them old arguments, them old feelings, them old injustices. And you might say to me, Joseph, you don't understand what they've done. You don't know what happened. You don't know what's gone. And it might be saying terribly heartaching and terrible and thing, especially if someone's been lost or someone's died or someone or something went on and then that person went uh, died or something. And you think, well, how can I, it can't be put right there. But listen, we can forgive. We have the God has given us the faith to forgive. So Jesus never said he was going to increase their faith. He just said all they need is small faith. Small faith for what? To forgive. We carry unforgiveness about like a burden. I know I did. This was before I was saved. And it was one of the things that led me to be saved. Because I used to, I'm no different than any other travelling man, but my life before I was saved was no different than anyone else. I was brought up no different than anyone else. And I had a lot of unforgiveness in my life. For certain people, for certain families, and it ate away at me. It made me so bitter. The first thing I thought about in the morning when I woke up, it was the last thing I thought about before I went to bed. And I remember in the end, I had so much hatred in me, so much evilness. I remember family, people who I loved, would pull me to one side and go, Listen, I'm coming on the talk to you. What's wrong with you? What's going on? You've turned so poison, you're like poison. You're going wild, like you've got like poison, what's wrong with you? Oh, shut up, you don't know what you're on about. And in the end, I remember driving and thinking that it was one of the things that I desired, that I knew salvation could bring me. That was one of the things that attracted me to Jesus. That he can cleanse my life of this unforgiveness because it's killing me. I'm going to end up dead or someone else is going to end up dead. And it's just, it's killing me. I can't live like this no more. It's not a normal way to live. It was eating away at me. I was tormented to death over it. And when I got saved, I promise you, thank you, Lord Jesus, the night I got saved, I felt the weight of the world lift up off my shoulders. Amen. And I had a love for people. The unforgiveness just went. The unforgiveness just went. And I remember reading the scripture and it said, when a man walks with the Lord, he makes even his enemies a piece of him. And I thought, hallelujah. I thought, yes, thank you, Jesus. That's what I want. I want to be at peace. I can't live like this no longer. And it don't matter what I thought or what I'd done. It, it didn't matter if I was 100% in the right, which I wasn't. I was the one in the wrong. But it if I was the 100% in the right and I was the people in the wrong, it was still killing me. It still eats away. It still kills. We carry it about like a burden and it wears us down. And sometimes when we get saved, the bigger problem is, is we still hang on to that unforgiveness. Because it's something that's sort of like hidden. It only creeps in every now and then. But it lays and it festers. And brothers, it causes big problems. Matthew 6, 15 says this, and this is the truth. If you don't forgive, neither shall you be forgiven. That's it. That's it. Jesus said it. That's it. If you can't forgive others... You won't be forgiven. And I've heard people try to explain that and go, well, no, look, if you're born again, it doesn't. Listen, that's what it means. That's it. You don't forgive. 
You won't be forgiven. That's it. Um, that's it, Matthew 18, 34. Talking about unforgiveness again, a, um, a parable of the unforgiving servant. We know the story, Matthew 18, talks about the unforgiving servant. The, the master called him in and said, you owe me £10 trillion pound pay me. And he went, I can't pay, Lord, please don't take me and my wife and children and sell us. And, please. And, the Lord, and the master forgive him. He went, Look, you know what? Don't worry about it, I'll wipe the slate clean. Forgive him. He begged and the, Lord, and the master forgive him. And then he went out. It's, it's about God. God's the master. Don't we? We're the servant. We've been forgiven. How much have we been forgiven of? Amen? Amen. We've been forgiven of so much, have we? Do you know what I mean? As I said earlier on, we're just scumbags saved by grace. We've been forgiven of so much, we're just sinners. And then all of a sudden, that man, that servant goes out and finds a servant I was in ten pound, grabs him by the throat, pay up, or otherwise I'm strangling the life out of you. Do you know what I mean? What, and then gets him thrown in prison and the other servant see it and went back to the master and went, you've just forgiven him of all that. He's just gone out and got someone by the scruff of the neck and threw him in prison. Over, they owed him a few quid. And he called the servant in, didn't he? And he chastised him. He said this, verse 34, and the master was angry and delivered him over to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Boys, unforgiveness is a big thing, isn't it? He's saying here that, he said, take him and hand him over to the torturers. And I just want to say something here. I know unforgiveness, right? It's here. It's a poison in the heart. But it spreads to here. And then it played, I know in my own life, it played upon my mind. They did this. They did. How could you let them get away with that? What are you going to do when you see them? What's your family? The family's going to think you're a, a, a canner. You're going to run away from them. You're a coward. What's going to happen? This one ain't going to. Everyone's going to be upset with you. This. You can't let them get away with that. They've done saying The torturers. Do you understand what I'm saying here? With unforgiveness comes its own battle in your own mind that again can be a foothold for the enemy to, to bring a, um, a darkness upon your own life, in your own mind. He handed him over, he said, hand him over to the torturers. And I think, and anyone I ever know who suffers with unforgiveness, <coughs> they live a tormented life, like I did. I woke up thinking about it, I went to sleep thinking about it, what I was going to do, what I was going to say, how I was going to... You know, the shame is that's happening to Christians as well. Because they're not letting go. They're not letting go. Let's turn back to Luke. Verse 7. Unforgiveness damages the person who holds on to it. It does. I'll tell you what it is like. Unforgiveness and bitterness and anger against someone. Sorry, Luke 17. What was that? 17 verse 7. That's it, sorry. I'm tired, boys, too, true. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think so, would you? I'm the you Unforgiveness does damage in the person. I'll tell you what it's like. Yeah, Luke 17, verse 7. I'm going to read this a minute. But I just want to just throw a move on. Unforgiveness is like, oh, and bitterness and anger, all them sort of things, is like you drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. The only person it hurts is you. Because you know the person you ain't got to, they, ain't, they don't care, they ain't got a clue. They don't wake up at night and they don't wake up at night speaking about it. The only person it'll affect is you. It's a poison in your life. And the enemy's got us tricked by thinking if we have that hatred somehow, it's going to hurt them. The only person it hurts is us. Jesus goes on to explain, he says, And which of you, having a servant, playing on a tending sheep, will say to him, 
when he has come in from the field, come in at once and sit down. Jesus goes on to say, look, when we forgive, we're just doing our duty to forgive. We shouldn't expect anything, any special reward. He's going to go on to say that, look, you, when you call your servant in, you have a servant, when he's doing the job that you've paid him to do, do you then reward him? You don't, do you? If you are a man that, you say, man, how much a block paid that bit of thing there, I'll tarmac that drive, and he'll say to you, a thousand quid. He does the job that you've asked him to do. He's quoted you. Right? You give him his, give him his thousand quid and then he goes, where's the rest of me money for doing... Well, you've only just done what I've told you to do. You get paid for doing the job, didn't you, that you've been told to do. That's it. There's no special reward. If you get a man to come in and pay him to decorate this house out, once he's paid, he's paid. It's our duty to forgive. It's our duty to forgive. Look, verse 8. But will you not rather say to him... Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk and afterwards then you eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that was commanded of him? I think not. Jesus is saying if you had a servant and you was paying him a wage to you got a man working for you and you give that man under quid a day, he works for you. When he's done everything he's done that you've paid him for, you don't go, thank you very much, are you? Say, here you go, here's your money, see you later. There you go. Because he's done what he's ever asked to do. Jesus is saying we are the servants. What he's going on to say is when we forgive, don't expect no special treatment. We think, oh, mate, I forgive that man. Lord, I tell you what, some special fella I am. No. You're not going to be thanked for it because it's our duty to forgive. Like it's that servant's duty to serve the master that's paying his wages or who owns him. It's our duty to forgive. Forgiveness is an integrated part of Christian life. Not once, not seven times, 70 times seven times 7,000 times seven million. At every point in my life. It was so important when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he said, our father, who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. <coughs> forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who are dead against us. Forgiveness. When he was teaching the disciples how to pray, he put forgiveness in, because yeah. he knew we was going to need it. You might have had things done wrong to you, you might have terrible things done wrong to you. There might be things that you don't even want to speak about. But let me tell you something. Through the strength and the power of the Lord as a Christian, not only is our duty, but we've God given us the faith. He's saying, look, I'm giving I, you... If you've got faith for mustard seed, you can do greater things than forgive. You can forgive. We have the faith to forgive. We can let go and let God take over. Because unforgiveness, I tell you what unforgiveness <coughs> does, in the end it'll kill you off. You can be the best preacher in the world, you can have a good walk and have plenty of good fellowship, and in the end, that just take over. And it'll just be the finishing of you. It'll finish you off. Unf- forgiveness is part of Christianity. It's what we're expected to do as God's children. When we do do it, we have no need to wear it like a badge. Oh, look what I've done there, Lord. Forgive that man. Do you know what? I must be... St- I think I'll tell everyone about that. What? I, you never, oh, you never guess what I've done today? <laughs> you know him with the swelled head who I didn't like? <laughs> I'll forgive him today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in the local newspaper. That's the best thing to do. Tell him. They would say, Lord, do you know what? I've done me duty. This is what he says. Look, read the thing this, verse 10. Verse 9. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants and we have done only what it was our duty to do. He's saying, don't make a song and dance about it. Yeah, one day you might share it in a testimony, like I've just shared with you. That was one of the things that made me realise God was real because I had such a hatred in my heart when God lifted it I was overwhelmed, but I 
was so thankful because it was killing me. But I didn't make a song and dance about it. He just did it and I was happy. He just did it. Don't, don't expect no special reward. You're just doing what you're meant to do. And, we, and what it is, we say, oh, I can't do it. It's so hard and if I do do it, oh, I think I, think I deserve it. No. Jesus is saying, listen, you don't need to have your faith in Christ. If you've got faith in the mustard seed, you can have the faith to, you've got the faith to forgive. You've got it. Forgive is your duty. I'll do what I'm asking you to do. And look, don't expect no reward for it because you're only doing, as my children, what I've asked you. Yes. Next time you think of that scripture, they go, if you have faith in a mustard seed, remember in this story what it was in context with. Forgiveness. And forgiveness is a very, very big thing. The disciples asked about it, and Jesus taught them about it. He even taught them about it in the Lord's Prayer when he taught them how to pray. It's a big thing. And the reason it's a big thing is because unforgiveness is the death of some Christians. Yeah. I know a man, a very, very good friend of mine, someone who I love very, very dearly, a good encouragement to me when I was first saved. He was a minister, he walked with the Lord, and he was in a local fellowship, and he was serving the Lord, and something went on, it wasn't his fault, and he, uh, he said, look, I think we should do this to deal with it. And it never, it never went the right way. They dealt with it another way. <coughs> and he got a bit all upset. And he said, so I can't work anyway. What he had done, he allowed bitterness to come in his heart against his brothers. So he left the church and went somewhere else, carried on serving the Lord, encouraging, doing a good work. But he, he wouldn't put it right with the brothers that he was working with. Or any, not so much even them, because I don't think no one done anything. In his own heart, he had bitterness in his own heart about that situation. He was all upsetting himself. He turned into bitterness, to anger. He ended up backsliding. He ended up back in the world and drinking drugs. He ended up killing himself. Took his own life. When the Bible says the devil comes to kill, to steal, kill and destroy, I've seen that play out in people's lives. From one minute serving the Lord to the next minute gone. Unforgiveness is a big thing. If you've got unforgiveness in your heart, go before the Lord. Ask the Lord to forgive you for having it. And then forgive them people. Amen. Let it go. Amen. Let it go and let the Lord minister in that area. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Amen. Lord, I pray, my God, Lord, in Jesus' name. I ask you, my Lord, please, my Father, God, Lord,